to Gravity Untethered. Hey everyone, I'm the host for tonight and moderator, Ryan Kobrick. I'm the executive director of Yuri's Night, and we've got a pretty amazing panel with us tonight. And uh, I'd like to welcome, of course, all the people that are watching. Thank you for hanging out with us. We'll try to get to your questions through Twitter and YouTube in any way possible. Uh, but this is our first hangout, so bear with us as we kind of go through our growing pains. Um, the, uh, this is going to be the first of several Hanging with Yuri panels that we'd like to run on Google+. Plus. So hopefully next month for November, we're going to run a Mars hangout uh, with the Maven launch coming up. That's going to be a big focus, and we really want to get some experts in here to talk to you about Mars exploration. I just want to let everyone know that's watching that the, the panel members are not officially representing their companies tonight. Um, they're all space tweeps. They're social media users with a passion for space. They're movie buffs. They're awesome people, and they want to share their insight. And they've got quite the spread of spacey backgrounds, so we've got quite the expert panel here. Um, this Hangout does contain spoilers for the movie Gravity. So if you have not seen the movie Gravity, you might not want to listen to us yet unless you want to listen to us and then go watch it and be like, oh yeah, they talked about that. That's completely up to you. Um, and this recording will be available on the Yuri's Night uh, YouTube page. So everything can be found through Yuri's Night later on, which is just www.yurisnight.net, and we'll pop up that website later on as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to go through and introduce everyone. Um, I'm going to have, I'd like everyone to kind of just spend a minute, introduce who you are and your background, and uh, we'll get going right away with, I've got a question set for everyone. We'll start uh, so on my left to right on my screen here. So Katie Coleman, please go ahead. Well, hi there. Uh, my name is Katie Coleman. I'm a NASA astronaut. And uh, I guess are we going to talk about our association with the movie, or what do, what do you want, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, say you can say who you work for. I'm just our opinions are our own kind of thing tonight. So um, well, I work for I work for NASA, and I worked for NASA, and I was up on the space station with Ron and with Paolo, who I think will be joining us uh, shortly. And um, a funny thing happened, which was that my little brother met Sandra Bullock's brother-in-law, and uh, they and her brother-in-law wondered if his sister would mind talking to Sandra about a movie she was making about being an astronaut. And so uh, that put Sandra and I together, and we got to talk a few times on the phone, and uh, our crew ended up you know, talking about different things that we thought she'd like to know. And it was really just a pretty fun thing. Ron was always pretty sure that she really wanted to talk to him, but was a little bit too shy. <laughs> yeah. And so I've since then gotten to go and uh, meet Sandra, and, and got to screen the movie early and, and to help a little bit um, just talk about NASA's connection with the movie, which, I don't know, anytime they make a, a movie in your own backyard, I was just really pretty thrilled to, to see space from that angle and bring up, watch other, see other people get to go to space. And it made me miss Ron. <laughs> Great, thanks. So next up, we've got Liz Warren. Liz, go ahead. Hi, my name is Liz Warren. And I also work at NASA Johnson Space Center. I'm a physiologist. That's a type of science about the human body. So I'm interested in what happens to human bodies when they go to space or other extreme environments. And I'm a movie buff. I like sci-fi. I think I got into thinking about working at NASA through watching Star Wars and Lost in Space when I was young. So I think I've always had, uh, had an appreciation for science fiction. But now that I'm a scientist in real, uh, in my real job, um, I like to make connections between science fiction and science reality. And so I saw the movie and I helped uh, put together a story that you may have seen on the web um, on the NASA.gov page, which connects some of the science that you see in the movie Gravity with real science that is actually happening on the International Space Station. And uh, hopefully we can talk about that a little bit uh, later tonight. It's not quite on our speaker, but we're, we're working on that, and we'll get that flowing soon. Uh, next up is Rob Perlman. Uh, it looks like his camera is active. Hopefully uh, you're able to see him. Uh, go ahead, Rob. Hi, um, I'm Rob Perlman. I'm the editor of CollectSpace.com and a contributing writer for Space.com. 
Uh, so I cover the space program um, and its activities. Through Collect Space, we focus on space history, in particular where um, space crosses over into pop culture. And so gravity was uh, right up that alley. Um, I had the opportunity to go out and interview both um, Sandra Bullock and Alfonso Cuarón uh, for the film, um, as well as Katie. Um, <laughs> and uh, we we profiled a lot of the film from what they got right to what they got wrong to um, the Easter eggs that are in the film, and uh, and in particular where where the passion and uh, and in particular, where, where the passion for spaceflight um, existed within the filmmakers' own vision, that they really wanted to have this film pay, play a, a role as a, um, um, as a tribute to everyone who worked on the space shuttle and the International Space Station, Soyuz, and, and even the um, uh, Tiangong-1. And so um, I thought they did a fantastic job. I got to see the film twice, once with movie critics and once with a bunch of friends and uh, the experience was great both times. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Next up, we've got Ron Guerin. Ron? Hey, thanks, Ryan. Um, so I'm Ron Guerin. I'm a former NASA astronaut as of a few weeks ago. I actually spent my last day at NASA the day before the government shut down, uh, so just a, a, few, a few weeks ago. And my claim to fame is I got to spend a few months in uh, space with Katie Coleman. Uh, and she uh, claims to have been in contact with Sandra Bullock, and I, I to this day don't believe that that was true. I think she made that whole thing up. Um, but I, I could be wrong. I'm not exactly sure. But the, the movie hit home uh, for me in a, for a couple of reasons. One is I've you know, had the fortune and opportunity to do a few spacewalks, so I could kind of evaluate you know, what what the imagery was to, to what the, the imagery I remember it, you know, the way I remember it being. And also, um, we had an incident uh, during the uh, time frame that I was on board the National Space Station where we did have a piece of space junk come really close and uh, went for some exciting times for, for a little bit. And I do, believe, I do believe Katie, I'm just kidding. Thanks, Ron. Next up, we have Tim Bailey. Hi, my name is Tim. I am a uh, parabolic flight expert. So I work with the Zero Gravity Corporation. I'm one of their nine flight attendants that gets to go up and help other people experience weightlessness, the same, uh, the same type of weightlessness and the same physics of weightlessness that, that you experience supposedly in orbit, but I guess I'll, I'll leave that up to the panelists to tell me if that's true or not. Um, but it, it's, it's free fall. So I've seen a lot of different people come on board and uh, film media spots and, and do things to film in a way that gives them uh, some legitimacy about being in microgravity, uh, including the Mythbusters, uh, and, and we've done a bunch of reality shows. So it's interesting to uh, hear about, and I'm, I'm really interested in um, what Rob Perlman got from the, the actors to know how they did those scenes. There wasn't a whole lot of free-floating that they did, uh, but there were a couple of shots that I'm really interested to know how they did because that was really good wire work if that's how they did it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you, Tim. Um, just seeing if our final guest has arrived yet. Looks like we're going to... He's a little bit delayed. Um, I guess we'll kind of jump into some other questions and hopefully uh, he'll be able to join us on the Hangout. Um, so I've got a bunch of kind of starter questions here. It, I've got one question that I'd like to ask everyone, and it's kind of along the lines of, you know, favorite moment and the moment where you were kind of like, uh, I don't know, that's a little bit pushing the, the reality boundary, even though this is a very artistic piece. Um, so I'd like to kind of go around the room again and get your guys' thoughts on, on what those might be. So favorite moment and then kind of like the one that made your eye twitch a little bit. So let's start it over with Katie. Hi, you guys. Sorry. Handling that mute button, you know, not always my <laughs> skill. Anyways, my favorite, my favorite, my, actually the one, so are we allowed to tell things? I don't want to spoil the movie for people. I don't know. Yeah. Well, this is, this is all about spoilers. We, we already had the waiver, so people okay. are in too deep now if they're watching. But yeah, definitely spoiler alert on this entire thing. You should have like a flashing sign when you're going to say something. <laughs> <a spoiler. laughs> 
Well, you know, certainly, in what I've been telling people, and I really feel it, is that um, I feel like this movie brings you not only the view that we had from Orbit, but the feeling of having that view, which is to me the most special thing. You know, just that, I mean, I always feel so lucky to be up there and to feel that. And, you know, I just, I would like to have everybody I know go see this movie because I think they get to understand a little bit about, I mean, despite the whole bad day aspect of what happens in the movie, it's still really clear that these people are in an amazingly special place and that it's a perspective that, that changes you. So I did just love that. I also just loved when uh, when uh, Sandra Bullock goes, I hate space. <laughs> <laughs> I just really love that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I guess the, the time when, when uh, George Clooney comes in the hatch, I mean, normally I wouldn't really be very opposed to that. You know, I'd be okay with George coming in the hatch. But, it, you know, I just thought they've got so many things right in this movie, so many things. Why are they going to go and do this so wrong? And then it turns out, of course, it wasn't really real. So I guess I was caught up in the movie. Okay, should I go, Ryan? You see Liz on the screen. I think she should go. Okay. So I think um, one of my favorite scenes was uh, after... Uh, Sandra's character gets on board the International Space Station and she uh, gets out of her suit and she just has a moment where she's like safe and she is almost in a little bit of a, almost a fetal position and she's floating and I thought that I was really amazed first of all of, the, of how they made it look like she was really floating but that was a very kind of a peaceful moment in the movie one of the only peaceful moments in the movie I recall except for the scenes before all of the chaos started and uh, among the scenes where I thought alright that's pushing it a little bit was um, I guess I would have to I would have to say when um, some of the scenes where their their mobility in, in the EMUs or the spacesuits looked uh, just a little too good and 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 their ability to, to uh, there was a little creative license there. But overall, such a beautiful film. I really enjoyed it. Cool. Thank you. Rob, you're up. I think um, my favorite part of, this, uh, of the film, uh, if I could walk you into the other room here, you'd see glass cases filled with space artifacts and pieces of the space shuttle and pieces of the, um, of the Soyuz and other vehicles. And... The fact that so many small details were recreated um, in fine detail, uh, even with liberties, but with, but to the point that you could recognize certain pieces, pieces that maybe everyone on this panel would be able to recognize, but the public wouldn't, and so there was no other reason to do it other than to, uh, to create a, a, a tribute to the spacecraft. Um, the second time I watched the film, I was really watching for these uh, for just panels and and little details along the way and I and I love the fact that they included those um, I also particularly liked Marvin the Martian's little cameo um, <laughs> because I could imagine him as he floated by going you know ooh that makes me so angry um, but uh, I guess the one point that, that sort of took me out of the film was uh, when George Clooney's character asked um, Sandra Bullock's character about where she was from and to tell her life story. If we assume that he didn't know those things, I thought even for a payload specialist who Sandra Bullock was supposed to be playing who's only been training for six months, that the one thing that you learn when you work around or cover the space program is that the, the crews get to know each other really well and so there wouldn't be an opportunity for, for them to not know each other or at least know the basics of their background. Um, but it was such a that's a minor point, and it may have been just uh, creative license there. So, all right. So, um, I guess I guess my favorite part was probably in the beginning. I, I've only seen the movie once, and I and I didn't watch it critically. I watched it just to enjoy it, um, and so I, I wasn't really um, dissecting it. Although there's some things that jumped out at me, and the first one 
was in the beginning before everything went south, you know, just the grandeur of what a space walk um, looks like. And um, that was, you know, really enjoyable because it did kind of throw me back there a, a little bit. And so I, I really like that. Um, and, and, you know, piggybacking on, on something that Robert said, um, what really struck me, and actually Liz as well, what really struck me um, was when Sandra Brooks' character went into the ISS and when she went to the Soyuz, how realistic it was. Down to the just you know amazing detail, and I started trying to look at it critically because I was really taken aback at how how exact it was to to the point where even the the books when she's looking through the books uh, and seeing the tabs on the books, I, I remember thinking, yeah, that's about where I put my tabs too. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing. Um, but one of the things, um, you know, like Robert said, you know, not knowing where Sandra Bullock's character was from and things like that, I, I found those. A, you know, a little bit distracting, but, but not not a big deal. But one thing that really got me was um, George Clooney's character saying, you know, where's the Soyuz? And not pronouncing, not, not pronouncing Soyuz correctly. And that really jumped out at me because it, it was such a contrast to the unbelievable detail that went into the rest of the movie to make everything as, as realistic and as true to life as possible, but not, you know, something as simple as just pronouncing the name of the spacecraft correctly. I felt really jumped out at me as... It's something that was kind of out of place. Do you think he was trying to be kind of like a cowboy? You know, maybe, maybe he was. Maybe, yeah, maybe he was. <laughs> maybe he was. Great, thanks. Uh, we'll skip Ian. Come, I'll go last. Tim, you go ahead. All right. Well, uh, I will agree with Liz that uh, when Sandra Bullock got inside of the ISS uh, airlock and uh, slipped. The, the suit off and just started spinning and, and just enjoying that little fetal position. Ah, uh, I'm safe. Uh, it looked really good. Uh, the, the one thing I did notice, though, was, A, it looked really easy to get that spacesuit off. And I don't think I've ever seen anybody slip a spacesuit off that fast. And two, she wasn't wearing a lot under the spacesuit. And I have this idea that there should be a spaghetti suit for some kind of thermal management, maybe a pair of socks to keep your feet warm. There were little things where she looked really good getting out of the suit. I just wasn't so sure that she would be that good-looking getting out of a spacesuit. It doesn't feel like that was accurate. So there were a couple of little times where I went, that looked too easy. Um, hmm. That so-called suit doesn't have a tether on it right now or any kind of umbilical. Where is she getting oxygen from <laughs> while she's going from module to module? Uh, so there were a, little, a couple of little times where I would be really in, involved in something and loving the, the view through the helmets uh, or, or the fact that she's just tumbling and tumbling and tumbling and tumbling uh, through space with, with no slowdown whatsoever. She started tumbling, she kept going at the same rate, and I, I thought those things were great. But there were a couple of little just pieces where I went, at this point, I would black out uh, from tumbling that much. My goodness. And if she was already feeling space sick, she should have gone everywhere inside that helmet by now. Uh, so it was just little pieces that I sort of wondered about, and I would, uh, was wondering um, how accurate they would be or if that was just part of the artistic license of the movie that you really don't want to see Sandra Bullock barf all over the inside of her spacesuit uh, in the very first few minutes of the film. So, you know, Tim, going back to what you first said, I mean, okay, this, this means we haven't been crewmates yet, okay, but if we were crewmates, you would know that basically, you know, no matter what I look like when I get out of the spacesuit, you're always going to say I look good. Okay, always. And if I'm Sandra Bullock, I am probably going to look good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, agreed, agreed. You look great getting out of the spacesuit. Fantastic. Okay. No, we, I'm purposely not saying anything at all. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my uh, favorite moment and cringe moment is kind of going to sound boring now because it's pretty much the exact same as Liz and Tim. Um, I'll kind of start backwards and answer a little bit of what Tim said that, um, you know, the fact that she didn't have on a liquid cooling garment kind of threw me off. It's like the suit just went flying off and um, I'm sure the astronauts wish that their suit could easily come off that quickly. Um, it's but, the summer version. The summer yeah. version. So that's, I guess that's a, just, you know, the move that everyone needs to know is the, uh, the throwing off of all the equipment. But yeah, just not the cooling garment, but at the same time, it was my favorite scene because it went from chaos to her just floating freely and tumbling in space, and it was kind of like in the fetal position. It reminded me of 2001, where things were quiet and calm. 
Um, and you can kind of get a feel for that she's just... Katie, you talked about how you guys were able to talk with Sandra in space, and um, in an interview I saw that she followed up with emails to ask you tons of questions, um, and I guess, would you say that maybe some of her character is reflected in your character and your personality? Did you see yourself a little bit within what she was doing during the movie? And kind of related to that, I don't know if... Uh, you know, we, I mean, I, I wish it was true, but, you know, we uh, certainly we didn't talk enough that she would know me well enough for the director, or, you know, it's not based on me. But what I, what I, one of the things that I really like a lot about the movie is that, um, you know, there is a woman hero. And it's, it's slightly regretful to me that she has to be a rookie, so she has to be the one who at the beginning doesn't know much and does some things that don't make sense and things like that. But... You know, as she goes through the movie and decides that she wants to live, you know, I, I like this, this spirit of, okay, that didn't work, now I'm going to try this. You know, what have I been taught? What do I know here? How can I use this? And that kind of determination, you know, is what I'm hoping a lot of young girls are going to realize is, you know, certainly they're capable of, and, and second, um, is cool. Um, so everybody knows that she survived, though. What's that? Now everybody knows that she survived. Well, you know, we don't know that. We just know that she tried really hard, right? <laughs> That's true. Like you said, spoiler. She went home and vacuum after she was done, okay? <laughs> Anyways, um, when, you know, when we talked, it was, it was, we talked a lot about how you moved up there and when you would be still and how you would be still and how, and how you would stop and, um, you know, and I, I'd like to think that, I, I don't really know, because we were both really busy at the, at the screening, but I'd like to think that some of the things did make a difference. And, and she's talked about this analogy, and then Karen Nyberg, I don't know if anybody got to see this on the web, but Karen Nyberg had demonstrated it, which was that I, I told her that if you took a, a single hair and you pushed, you know, really slowly on that hair and used it to kind of push, you know, to push against something like a handrail, you could push yourself across the space station. And it's absolutely true. And if you do it real quickly, you're going to break that hair. But it really, you know, it, it takes very little to move yourself. And I, I think that that comment was meaningful to her. A lot of the things that we talked about um, are things that Paolo and Ron and I would talk about at dinner. And, and you know, the, the various things that she wanted to know. And then I would make some audio clips and send them to her. But often it was a crew kind of, uh, crew kind of thing. Great, thanks. Like that, when I was watching the movie, I was like, "Oh, this could kind of be." I could picture Katie and Mike Massimino up there or something. Just kind of Clooney's personality in the movie seemed a little bit mirrored to to very uh, uh, storytelling mode that um, Mike's been known for. And I guess a kind of follow-on question for Ron: Ron, if uh, somebody was going to play you in a movie. Who do you think that should be, or who would you want it to be? <laughs> Pee Wee Herman? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, that's a that's a good question. Some I, I guess somebody strikingly handsome, but um, no, it's a, it, you know just going back to the to movie for a second, and and as Katie said, you know having contact with Sandra about I don't know a week or so before the movie premiered, I, I got an email from Sandra that said. Um, Basically, we took some license, some artistic license, but I think you're going to be really, really happy, uh, and you're going to love it. And that's exactly right. And I, I probably can count on one hand um, the times during the movie where I was like, "Ooh, that's uh, that's not quite right." But but I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly right either. And I think the things there are more things in the movie that they got exactly right um, that really made you know for for those of us that that have um, some knowledge of the space program, and it makes it for a much more enjoyable experience to, to know that they're they're, they're accurately portraying a, a lot of a lot of the things. So, I mean, I, I think some of the things that were you know almost cringeworthy were the way they communicated with each other. Um, you know, I, I I tend to think that we're a little bit more professional than that. Um, and the fact that you know that they, the characters didn't really know each other beforehand, 
Um, the fact that orbital mechanics wasn't really considered in anything that they did, or, or like Liz said, you know, the, the way they were maneuvering before the, 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 uh, uh, the, the chaos started uh, was very unrealistic. But I think after the chaos started, I, I could see potentially, you know, moving that fast. However, uh, I'm not sure the spacesuits would have survived um, the impacts that they were putting on the spacesuits. Um, but uh, again, I think that the things that were technically perfect way vastly outweighed those things that were that were um, probably misrepresented a little bit. <clears throat> cool, thanks, uh, Rob. This question is for you. Um, so, sorry, I just had to dig up where I put the question. Um, if a major accident like this occurred in space. Um, the, I guess the question is, the, you know, the media reaction, but have you received any kind of press training that would help you kind of uh, help with the messaging that would be required to the public? Um, well, what's depicted in the film is probably the worst day in space ever imagined, and I heard a lot of people who are closer to the space program than I describe it that way. Um, the pace at which it unfolds as well is incredibly quick in the film, um, which would question how quickly we could, as members of the media, be able to react. I mean, we'd have stories out immediately that there's a problem, um, but the uh, ability for NASA or other agencies to get out details, uh, even assuming that we were already at Johnson Space Center or elsewhere watching and listening in. Um, but in general, you know, when a spacewalk occurs, um, regardless of what they're doing on the spacewalk, uh, the there's one group of people that are sitting there for the full six and or five and a half hours to six hours that are not at NASA, and that's the the space media who are watching um, it unfold. And it's our job to try to recognize when things are not going as planned. Um, we we had a situation like that not too far ago when uh, Luca Parmitano had his um, had his suit start to fill with water. Uh, as it unfolded, there was, a, um, just on my own network of, of journalists, we started pinging each other, saying, you know, is this really happening? Is this as serious as it sounds? Um, and starting to call NASA and saying, what, what's the story here? Um, but I'm not sure, given the pace that the film plays it out, how quickly the media on the ground could um, could get the story out, that other than there's been an, an impact with the space shuttle and that the crew is feared lost. Um, so Robert, what, was, what was NASA telling you in, in Luca's situation? Uh, the initial response from NASA was that it was a um, was that it was not a life-threatening situation and that that the crew had training for this uh, to be able to get back to the airlock. Um, in some ways that was accurate but I think as we went on and we heard more from Luca and his um, in his own interviews and, and the blogs he sent down, uh, we got a better public understanding of just how close he was to his own self feeling that he was out of control within his suit. Um, that whether he'd have to, I think in one blog he wrote about uh, the potential of, of decompressing part of his suit to, to remove some of the water and uh, obviously that's a lot more serious than saying that it's not a life-threatening situation because that's sort of the definition right there. Um, so uh, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions. What would have happened if that was, if that situation occurred elsewhere during the spacewalk? If he wasn't as close to the airlock as he was, um, and if he was on the arm at the time, um, just how much you know you could respond uh, to uh, to that scenario. Um, but uh, I think that those incidents prove. I mean, it's a great example of the difference between, and this is something that Alfonso Cuarón actually brought up, that there's a great difference between real spaceflight and the um, and what uh, and what was portrayed in the film, and that there are a lot of procedures already in place and a lot of backup uh, checklists and such that would call for certain steps to be taken if an emergency occurred that were that they just couldn't include in the film. He said he, 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 Alfonso Cuarón said that he could not accommodate 
the amount of preparedness that NASA puts their astronauts through. Otherwise, you'd be spending a good deal of the time just going through, well, let's try this, let's try this. Um, and it wouldn't make for a good film. And so that's one of the separations from reality. But uh, that would be, um, I think, the, the in terms of what we saw with Luca Parmitano, that's as probably as close as I can remember in terms of a spacewalking incident where uh, where it was as serious as maybe some of the things shown in the film. Great, thanks, Rob. And uh, it's a heavy question, so I want to follow it up with um, a video that you provided. Um, <laughs> you've uh, you've collected more space debris than anyone else I've ever known, and you know I hope to own some of that space debris of yours one day. Um, but I'd like to play this clip that you shared with us. It's an exchange between you and Sandra Bullock and the director. And just uh, if everyone bears with me, I'm going to share a screen here. And uh, just ask the uh, panel to mute their mics so that hopefully everyone hears the sound of the video. Okay. Just give me one second here. I'm just refreshing. Tracy calling Hemlock Holmes. Go ahead, Tracy. Elroy, you're a genius. A regular chip off the old block. It's more for time. In addition to reporting the news and reporting about space history, we also curate space artifacts. If you ever find yourself um, outside a spacecraft needing uh -huh. a handhold, this is an actual oh handle that Are flew on the space shuttle. Uh, oh my god, I still have to hide this from my son. This is going to become <laughs> like his favorite projectile and like, this is fantastic. So an actual handle from the space it, shuttle. I mean, you gave me something from the space shuttle, and I've been trying to get something from this movie that I could take <laughs> home, and I've yet to get it. This is fantastic. Thank, I mean, this I know everything has Velcro on it. It's a great. It's it's amazing. Thank you great. so much. My pleasure. Well, I think that's my time, but I'll leave you with a, an actual piece of the uh, of a real space mission. Um, no way. Yes. Uh, in addition to reporting the news, we. We curate artifacts, and so this is a actual piece off the tethered space satellite um, that flew on STS-75 in 1996. Um, figured tethered was appropriate for the for the topic. Oh man, let me write this down. Oh, no, I've got all the information, all the information. in the bag. This so. is man, this is <laughs> yes. absolutely awesome. So this is absolutely awesome, man. This has been up there now. It's been up there, yes, on the space shuttle on a mission that didn't go well. The tether snapped. Um, okay. <laughs> just like your <laughs> So it's wow, even appropriate. Man, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, that was awesome. Too. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, um, back to the chat here, everyone. Um, Thanks Only again, Rob, Rob Perlman would have enough space yeah. artifacts to be able to give some away. Yeah, well, we spent a couple of uh, I spent a couple of weeks looking for the proper things for them. Um, That's uh, pretty marvelous. It was. Uh, I don't know if you caught there at the very end. Um, we had a little bit of a post logo clip there that Sandra was saying thank you again, but then she says, "Don't tell the astronauts outside; they'll be pissed." Oh. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that, but jealous, certainly, okay. <laughs> hey, but, you know, awesome. um, I wondered if we could go back to talking about um, you know, what, when we talk about whether it's real or not, or, you know, how exciting a day this was at NASA and how we'd have procedures. I mean, this is where I think it's nice to hear from Liz, where, 
some of the things that we're, do, you know, the research that we're doing is part of the reason that we don't, that people don't make movies about what we do every day because it is boring because we thought these are the risks. I mean, the risks and gravity are real. I mean, there's space debris, there's fire, there's not coming home, all those things. And yet we think, what if this happens? What if this happens? And even some of the, the research that we're doing, I think, has a big applications both for space travel and for Earth travel. And uh, those are some of the stories I think Liz is really great at telling. Well, absolutely. And Katie, you and I have talked about this kind of extensively. You know, when you go up and you're living on the space station, you're working really hard at doing research that benefits all, all of us here on Earth. And absolutely, your life is at risk, but it's a mitigated risk. At NASA and our space agencies, we work really hard to minimize risk, but there is risk. But the research that we're doing and what we're learning on the space station, uh, to you, I know, and to the other astronauts, it's, it's worth the risk. And, you know, one example, you know, there's, there's a fire in the space station, um, and it looks like it was a, a function of the SIR, which is the Combustion Integrated Rack. Uh, at one point, um, Ryan Stone is, is floating by, uh, and she passes a couple of little flame balls, and I was really happy that they got that right, because fire in space does not form that very typical kind of candle uh, burning shape. And that's because there's no convection. So hot air doesn't rise and cold air doesn't sink. And that convection drives something that we call it's, it's buoyancy, essentially. And because that doesn't exist, we are able to study fire and combustion in a new way, in a more fundamental way. And how important is combustion to our planet? We use combustion for a multitude of things. And in the study of combustion in microgravity, if we can learn how to make fuels just a little more efficient because we're able to more fundamentally understand their burning, or if we're able to reduce pollution just a little bit, reduce the amount of soot produced uh, by burning a fuel just a little bit, these changes in the economy of the global economy will have tremendous impact. And so that's why we like to study such fundamental things. Um, we saw water droplets, tears forming spheres of water. You know, surface tension uh, is a fundamental force that becomes a little more important when you remove gravity. Uh, so we study the way water works. And in fact, you know, my PC, my Mac here is pretty warm. I hear a little fan going. There are there's actually fluid in my PC, in my computer, that is acting as a, as a cooling wick. And we're actually able to make more uh, efficient cooling wicks by understanding fluid flow and using capillary flow to move liquid rather than a pump. Um, so those are two uh, important uh, research areas where we're able to study very fundamental things when we remove gravity and 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 find uh, some of the magic within things that we see every day but don't really see what's really going on. So, I mean, I think sometimes again, it's not clear the the sort of magnitude of that. Like, um, I know when we did some combustion experiments, there's things that we measure on the ground that we have to measure to get the slope of a line, we have to measure in less than a second, like in, you know, mil like, you know, whatever, thousandths of a second. And then up on this, up on the space station, we can make those measurements over 30 to 40 seconds. Huge long time, hundreds and hundreds of data points. And so it's really pretty different, the conditions up there and what we're able to see. Liz, Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad Absolutely. you, uh, you talked about that because my next question was going to be for you, and it was going to be flames, plants, and tears, oh my. So uh, I'm, you've covered that beautifully, and we can come back to some more of the physiology and, you know, if their hearts would have actually exploded from the high rates they probably would have gone through and the low Ooh. oxygen levels. But, um, again, it's just part, it's not just part of the, the way it was portrayed. It was like the message of, you know, the astronauts running out of oxygen on EVA was the key part of it. And, People were commenting on percentages that didn't know they were asking me questions. They're like, could 4% really last that long? I'm like, well, you know, and I started getting into what if it was a different compressed oxygen and 
everything else. So I, I didn't even go into it, but for the most part, a lot of people kind of picked up on that, uh, the small parts of physiology. Um, and kind of related to physiology, or before I get to your question, Tim, you're next. Um, I just wanted to comment on that handle, that Rod, that you gave uh, over to Sandra Bullock. That's pretty cool. And one of the other things that I couldn't believe in the movie, but it, meaning like, as in I was just like, wow, not as in oh, I don't believe that, was every time she opened a hatch, and it would fling open, and she would swing across, holding on. I'm like, oh my god, she's got amazing grip strength. So uh, I guess the rumors are true about uh, rock climbing and everything else for being a good astronaut is that you really need good grip strength when it comes down to it. Um, I don't know if Ron or Katie want to comment on grip strength before I asked him. Well, well, before grip strength, the hatch is all open in, so it'd be, it would be impossible to, to, to do that. But... If, if if they if they went with the the reality, then they wouldn't be able to get back in the space station. So I think they had to stretch it a little bit. But um, I mean, for that reason, so so the the hatches can't blow open. So because the pressure inside the station or inside the airlock is holding the hatch shut. Um, so but but grip strength is is very important because you know when you're out on a, a six or seven hour spacewalk, you're you're basically you know, every time you grab something, it's it's almost like you know those uh, exercise that grip things that you squeeze because your your glove is pressurized. So you have to overcome the rigidity of it first of all, but also the pressure in there. And um, you know, it's very um, fatiguing, especially on your hands, um, to be out on a spaceboat. So Tim, you're the master of um, I don't know, like transitional gravity. And you're used to seeing and helping people bump into each other all over the place and seeing them bump into each other from a lot of different angles. And you kind of touched upon this a little bit uh, when you were talking about the movie. But do you feel that the way it was filmed um, had an accurate kind of portrayal of how the body would move through space? And, of course, we've got two astronauts with us to kind of answer that as well. But I really wanted to kind of get your feel for kind of jumping from uh, you know, a high gravity environment to a low gravity environment. Uh, I was actually really impressed with the the way that they filmed the movie. I kept watching to see what they were doing and where the wires were and uh, what kind of you know plate. He had his pivot points are. They'll keep pivoting around the same point on their body that may not be their center of mass all the time. Uh, so just watching for some of those pieces was uh, difficult because there was a lot of out-of-frame shots. They really shot the movie beautifully to be able to uh, mask all of the, the things I thought that, that they were doing. Uh, a lot of CG, I assumed, was, was going on there, like her tears. Um, it was interesting, but I felt like that was uh, just very obviously CG for me um, to watch them go off, but really well done. The, the straight shots when she's flying down through the space station I I honestly thought maybe they just superimposed her head on somebody else that was actually on space station because it looked really good, it's and Katie. I have no idea how they did it. <laughs> it was just Katie in the space station, <laughs> and they superimposed chaos around her. Um, and it, it was a little disappointing because I always want to tell people, if you had only come and flown on a parabolic flight, you could have really done a lot better with that scene. You could have made it look a whole lot better, and I... I honestly don't know that they could have done any better with it, and that's really disappointing because um, the movie really, really looked good to me. I mean, to me, actually, it's, that's one of the things that I really try to talk to people about, about what is magic about being up there, and I don't know what Ron thinks, but you know that it's not about the floating. It's about the flying from place to place. And so I, did, I love seeing her just fly down the modules you know, just like that because... It's just something you don't have the freedom to do here, and it reminds you that you're someplace really, really special, and it's like being a colonist. So I, I, I like that they found, they figured out that aspect of it. Yeah, and I, I think, don't know I mean, how they did I, it. Yeah, I mean I agree with with, with what everybody said, and I, I think the only thing that was a little bit out of place, and this is isn't from a, a weightless point of view, this is just kind of an operational point of view, is before all the chaos started. Um, we wouldn't be as reckless as they apparently were. But there was, you know, one thing that really st stuck out at me, and again, I didn't watch the movie critically, but there was one scene where Sandra Bullock is using a, a pistol grip tool, you know, basically a power wrench, to um, to take take a bolt out, and um, there's, there was this strap that kept floating back, 
and she'd knock it away, and it would bounce, and it would float back, and it was it was obviously annoying. You know, would have been annoying, and that's exactly what it's like. You know, because for every action is an opposite and uh, equal and opposite reaction, and so when you knock a, a flap or, or something away, it's just it's going to come right back again in a, in a couple of seconds. So um, I, I, that really hit me as being extremely accurate, um, and and I didn't see anything. Um, you know, uh, they did a lot of things really, really well. Like when they're grabbing for things, it, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, one hundredth of an inch away. It, it's, you might as well be a thousand miles away. It's the same thing. You're not going to be able to, to, you know, swim your way over to get it. It just that, that's that's a, you know, you get what you get. And so I thought they they did that really well. From a behind the scenes perspective, um, knowing once you learn how they actually achieve some of this stuff, and it makes it even more impressive in the sense that every scene that you see outside um, outside a vehicle, the only thing that's real are the faces um, and some parts of the helmet. Everything else is, is CGI generated. Um, but inside, in order to reproduce, like floating down the length of the space station, um, the filmmakers had to first animate the entire scene ahead of time and then they developed a what they called the light box, which was this um, nine by nine box uh, that w had LED lights that um, that then suspended uh, on a twelve wire harness, Sandra Bullock in the middle of it, and she had to coordinate her actions to the animation so that when she pushed off, it would coordinate with the timing of uh, of pushing off. The station, um, uh, and because she, when she first signed on, they were initially thinking of using um, the the 727 zero uh, G and and filming in in parabolic flights, but she doesn't particularly like flying, and that was not going to be something that she was um, up for, and so they had already devised this light box opportunity. So when they came in and they said, "Well, we're not going to be doing." parabolic flights, but we're going to have to string you up on 12 wires in a box for nine hours a day, that was then uh, amenable to her. And it really came out. It really, she had to learn, uh, well, one thing I missed is that on the outside of this box were cameras mounted on robotic arms, the same type of robotic arms used in automobile manufacturing. And, uh, and so at some points the camera was moving very quickly around her and so she needed to know her exact stop points otherwise there was a danger of the camera hitting her um, and I just thought that entire process of of reinventing how to film zero-g well obviously from the film had a major payoff it's good to know that they at least uh, thought about doing parabolic flight but man ah. Uh, uh, sad that they didn't go for it. Although, honestly, they have some scenes in there that are a lot longer than 30 seconds, and they would never have been able to get such a clean shot. Uh, and I was watching for that, sort of timing it in my head, going, you're, you're way over our threshold. This looks amazing. Well, so what, what would be nice if they did Zero-G is just, I, I think it is just the most sort of delightful, amazing feeling. And in fact, uh, you know, and so you kind of wish that the people who made this movie, they, they must have really been passionate about space. I mean, that's really clear to me. And so you'd like them to have a little bit of that feeling as well. Too. Maybe some of them did come on board. I, we never know who it is that's actually, I mean, we know who they are, but, you know, right. it's, it's never, people don't announce usually what they're on there for. Sometimes it's after a flight talking with somebody that they'll go, well, I'm sort of here for this reason or that reason. I'm with this company or this production and we're looking and thinking about things. So um, I wonder if some of them did go and do a couple of flights uh, or maybe just in some small aircraft, you know, float the pencil just to get an idea in their heads because I found that's really critical. Um, sometimes with people find it really useful to have that experience, even at 30 seconds at a time, to be able to go, oh, oh, I get it now when you touch something and it floats away from you and you can't, can't get it and that's annoying and how annoying that is. Uh, they at least get a taste of, uh, of that. Well, plus, that would have helped Sandra Bullock develop the character um, in those scenes where she's she's holding back uh, getting sick. I think that would have been very advantageous for her as an experience to, put, to, to touch back on. 
you know, seriously, though, talking about the just the making of the movie for her, I've, I've seen some of the interviews, and you know, it's almost like that was that was a mission in itself, and that there was a lot of um, sensorial uh, sensory dip- deprivation. I mean, she spent all these days with basically, you know, with no light, hearing only the director's voice, and you know, having to create this character that had been through this tragedy, and you know, and I don't know, Ron, what what. It would. It's like for you, or really for any of us that you know can't be with our kids whenever we want to. But for me, this was a pretty emotional movie. I mean, in, in our job, you know, we have to go off and you know go to Russia and train and you know Europe and Japan and Canada and and, and it's hard to go to. It's hard to say goodbye to your family and and you know I'm usually kind of emotional about that when I'm by myself and not going to upset my family, but. You know, I take those emotions and I put them in a place, and they, in general, you know, don't have a place at work. But I find that when there is a place for them, when there's a sort of form, uh, you know, a, a a place where you can be sad, like maybe watching movies on a transatlantic flight or something like that. I, I try to avoid the movies where, you know, the something happens to the kids, something happens to the parents, because that's when I will actually, you know, have those emotions and. It will be an emotional time, which is kind of not so great when it's strangers next to you. That's when it's nice to fly with your crewmates, right? But yeah, uh, anyway, so for me, it's a pretty emotional movie, and I think for her, you know, just from reading some of the things and talking to her a bit, it was a really, it was that that was an, that was a big challenge. I mean, I think that takes a strong person to make that movie. Yeah, you could definitely tell the intensity, even in uh, some of her interviews when they said that they. They actually had her baby kind of pop up into the uh, the cube or that she was working in, and just to kind of cheer her up. And uh, the kid was like, "What's going on in here?" And it was it sometimes made it tougher just because he was seeing her in distress um, to film this. So it was it's an interesting kind of point as well. Um, so we have a a bunch of questions from our audience, and uh, we've got at least four from Angela Gibson, but I'm gonna pick one, Angela. Um, who's A-G-I-L-I-S-T-A-A-G on Twitter, Agilista, A-G. Uh, and Ron, she wants to know about Fragile Oasis. Oasis. Uh, you began your work with uh, on the ISS, and mostly afterwards you were pushing that forward. She wants to know how space affected your direction once back on Earth. Um, well, I, I guess, the, the, real quick, the story of Fragile Oasis. Um, Fragile Oasis was born out of really a frustration I had on my first flight, which was back in 2008, where I had this unbelievable experience and I couldn't really share it with anybody real time. And so when I came back and got assigned to a, to a six-month mission, this was really kind of before social media had taken off and, and certainly wasn't uh, at the extent that it is now. And so initially, Fragile Oasis was um, you know, born out of a desire to be able to bring people along on the mission, not as just as spectators, but as fellow crewmates. And so, um, but what it evolved into it was, an, and it's still evolving actually, but what it, what it, the, the next stage of it was, uh, okay, so we have this experience of being in space, what do we do with it? And I think um, what it came down to is trying to use this perspective we have of our planet to inspire people to, to go out and make a difference and make the world a better place. And, and that stemmed from um, really this, this gut-wrenching feeling that I had while I was up there, um, which is this contradiction between the beauty of our planet and, and the realities of life on our planet for a significant portion, and this really feeling that it doesn't have to be this way, and, and you know we can you know strive to make life as beautiful as our planet is visibly beautiful from space, and so um, that's kind of um, what my, my my call to action is, I guess, from from my experience is is trying to do just that. Um, Trying to use that that experience and use that perspective uh, to inspire people to make a difference, and um, but not just talk about it. Try try and actually do that myself as well. And for people who don't know, uh, we didn't discuss this, but Ron actually helped us with our mission of inspiring people about human spaceflight. And 2011, he actually before his flight, not in 2011, called us up in 2010 and said. Hey, do you think I could get a Yuri's Night shirt? And we're like, well, <laughs> sure, okay, why not? And uh, and then a few days later, I believe he called again. He's like, do you think I could get five more? And we're like, five more? <laughs> yeah, where do we send them? <laughs> so uh, the shirts got sent up the station, 
And that was really cool for us to have. Here's a nice photo of uh, Ron and Katie playing in zero G. See, the picture is uh, upside down, not... though. It's a, actually, the, 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 my head is on the floor there, so it's upside down. <laughs> um. <laughs> I haven't seen that picture in such a long time. Oh, that's right. There you go. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot more sense now. I'm like, yeah, you know, it would be that hard to put someone on your shoulders in zero G, but. <laughs> Upside down, that's a bit harder. Yeah, I was just, I was just kidding. It was, it was quite the first time. Yeah, so it was so special to have those shirts, and I mean, there's a picture of like all uh, six yeah, of us I'll together. Yeah, I'll pull that up for you. I just, uh, I love that. Maybe you guys can tell us about your Yuri's night up there. I think you guys did a dinner and a movie that year. It was. Yeah, what did we watch? I don't, I don't remember. I think we did have a movie. I don't remember what we watched though. Some of those Russian movies, they all look the same to me. <laughs> <laughs> we watched Gravity. An early, an early would you want to watch Gravity on Space Station? Yeah, I would love to watch I'd, I'd love to watch Gravity, sure, of course. Yeah, it'd be cool. Actually, that night on uh, that April, April 12, 2011, uh, uh, Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull, that was the premiere of that duet that we did together. Um, he happened to be playing a, a concert in Perm, P-E-R-M, Russia. And so it was just pretty neat to know that you know we were up there celebrating, and he was down there, you know, showing the duet, which was was pretty cool. I just remember being gathered around in the Russian segment. I mean, it just seemed like it was the only place to celebrate yeah. Yuri's. Night. And you know, Yuri Gagarin's photo is there all right. the time, and you know, it's like he lives there on the station, and all of us kind of hanging around at different angles and. You know, it's like being at one of these breakfasts or something. There's all these little foods, and you would think it's inconvenient to have a lot of different kinds of food out, but everything would be just kind of laid out on tape or under rubber bands or whatever, and you'd have this whole, like, smorgasbord kind of spread. And, um, you know, those those times of hanging out together, it's more about being with the people, and I, I feel a little bit of that every time I run into... You know, somebody in the hallway, or the other day I was uh, Capcoming at Mission Control, and Andrei Borisenko was the uh, Glavny over in Russia, so we got to talk on the loops a little bit. And uh, it's just really, really special to be up there together. So I've got the photo up now on my screen of the crew hanging I out here. That. Is that your only clean shirt at the time, or...? <laughs> yeah, so that's, I remember I gave you that shirt, and I didn't wash it first. Yeah, it had a, a bit of a metallic smell to it, and uh, <laughs> that we're trying to figure out what space. We, yeah, we're trying to figure out what we can do with it um, for an exhibit. We've got a whole bunch of cool Yuri's Night swag items that we'd want to put with it, so that could be a, a contest or something we put out there for museums and science centers this year. See if somebody wants to host our our uh, our space debris, if you will. Um, I'm sure Rob would love to host it at his place, but probably want it on display for a few people. Um, and, you know, maybe since I'm down at Kennedy Space Center, I can find out if we can put it somewhere around here. So also in that picture is our other uh, Missing in Action uh, Hangout uh, member. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> he sent us a message. He said, it's easier to get into space than to get into the Hangout. <laughs> so thanks, Paul. Um We'll definitely make sure we connect with you on a future Hangout. I'm sorry that um, things can connect properly this time. Now, I will out myself that this picture made me cry. Really? Seeing, seeing all of you guys up there with Yuri's Night t-shirts on and, uh, you know, celebrating with the entire planet and just uh, the international crew all together uh, visibly celebrating Yuri's Night. And as that, I, it was an iconic image that we could not have asked for any better than that and, and not knowing for sure if it was going to come or not. Um, it still makes me tear up when I see people in space celebrating Yuri's night. Every time it gets me that uh, that was the goal. You know, what is this holiday that you're going to celebrate a thousand years from now when the majority of human beings have left the planet? You'll you'll probably celebrate that first trip. And to see all of you up there and to hear how great of a time that you had and that it was really a time to get together and celebrate makes me choke up every time that I see the picture. So thank you. Thank you so much from Planet Earth. We really appreciated that. And from the Yuri's Night uh, Board of Directors and Global Executive Team, that was more than we could have ever dreamed for, was to see you guys up there celebrating with us. Well, that, was, that was fun. You know, it's funny, when uh, when we launched uh, a couple weeks before that, we were designated as the 50th anniversary launch, and 
Yuri Gagarin's picture was on the name uh, was on the, the spacecraft, and, and his name was on the spacecraft. And I remember when we lifted off, um, uh, um, Sasha Samokotak, who was the Soyuz commander, said in Russian, of course, um, you know, in the words of Yuri Gagarin, "Payehli," which in Russian means "we're off," which is what Yuri Gagarin said. But, but you know, I, I didn't plan on doing this. It just happened spontaneously. My my words of wisdom were "woohoo!" <laughs> just started. started Shouting, and I didn't realize that it went over the radio. So now all this, when you look at this historic 50th anniversary launch, there's some, some joker in the background, you know, with a movie as we, as we lift it off. <laughs> the human element. Absolutely. I posted up another photo here. Uh, That's Ron a nice Texas. picture. That is a That's beautiful, a beautiful picture. What a tremendous photographer. <laughs> this one made me choke up. This was, it was like... That's our logo. We're all volunteers, and it's floating free in space with the limb of Earth in the background. And I was like, "This is this is just awesome." And then it kind of got more and more awesome thanks to Ron. With you know, he sent a postcard. I can show you guys the photo later. We'll put it online, um, like our celebrate invitation kind of postcard that we produced. Um, and then the photos came of the of the crew, and we're like, "Oh my God, this is unbelievable." Um, the video though, that was completely unexpected. Um, I got a phone call. I'm not going to say who called me, but they're like, we have this video here, and we're supposed to get it to you. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And so Ron and the crew had recorded a video, and it was sort of a, a, a surprise for everyone. I think it was the day before Yuri's night that we got it, and we got it online as soon as we could. Um, but, yeah, those, those are some great memories, and we hope to continue that tradition with uh, future crews and have everyone celebrating Yuri's night around the world. Um, I do want to jump back to the movie. I mean, I love talking about movies. I love talking about Yuri's Night. Maybe we'll do a Yuri's Night movie. Um, but there's kind of a lot of topics that are out there. I don't know if there's anything specific that you guys wanted to cover. Uh, we covered EVA. We covered science. We covered zero G. We didn't really talk about orbits in the timeline. Um, that was, you know, had some artistic license, but you know, maybe in the future they're going to line up every single space station and asset in a row and somehow build a new shuttle. And So maybe in an alternate kind of reality that is possible. So I didn't really want to, like, poo-poo that too badly because there's some element to it where, you know, they could line things up. Um, the the timeline's obviously pretty fantastic. 90-minute orbits, um, the debris occurs, and then 90 minutes later hits again, 90 minutes later hits again, and that's the movie timeline. Uh, and there's a lot that happens within that frame. So it's, I, I think it's just fantastic. I'm, I, what I'm kind of hoping is that people who watch this are similar to the age where maybe when I watched Apollo 13 or uh, where other people actually watched Apollo 13. Um, and I hope it inspires them because it is very beautiful and picturesque and it has a lot of elements of you know, risk, danger, it's got a, a, a very good personal story that, that threads it all together. Um, and I just kind of like with that kind of open-ended rant or whatever, <laughs> just thought you guys might want to kind of chime in on what you felt about a little bit of those topics as well. Maybe we can talk about uh, orbits or space debris, you know, that's kind of the, the biggest topic of them all. Um, we haven't really touched on that, and that's a very important um, consideration for how satellites are launched into space today. We have to be aware of how we're going to deorbit them at their end of life and um, it's, you know, it's a reality that we have to face that the more stuff we put up there, the more responsible we have to be in, in what happens to it up there. It, it was fascinating to me. I was just going to jump, jump in real quick and say that um, after doing the PR, the, the press junket there that Robert Perlman was at as well in California, and, and telling people, hey, you know, at NASA, we think about these things, and, you know, we're ready for them. It doesn't mean we've solved all the problems, but we certainly think about them. I, you know, I got off the plane. I went straight to mission control. We had a conference with the crew because the Cygnus, the newest supply ship from Orbital Sciences, had just launched, and I was the Capcom for that. And what they figured out was by launching just a little bit late, it launched right into a conjunction with a very known piece of state, space debris. And basically, for days and days and days, you know, we were talking about, okay, so if we change the Cygnus orbit by this much, you know, that's great for Cygnus now. It's not going to run into that piece of space debris. But what does it mean if Cygnus, you know, loses its power to control itself? It, what if, you know, if Cygnus is now going to hit the space station? All these permutations, exactly, you know, what we were talking about, that, you know, it's a part of everyday life. 
you know, for living in space is understanding where this debris is and, and making sure that you can operate within it. Yeah, and, and we had an interesting uh, thing happen during our mission after you left, Katie, um, which was, you know, we track um, as many pieces of space junk as we can, and uh, if we think one is going to get close to the space station, then to some extent we have the capability to change the orbit of the sta space station, either raise it up or lower it down, um, whatever uh, is, makes the most sense. And so, um, for whatever reason, we a fairly large piece of space junk was coming our way and we didn't have enough warning to be able to have the time to to boost the, the, or, the orbit up. And so what we end up doing is basically closing every hatch on the space station, every single one. This, and we did something called shelter in place. And I think it was only done one other time since the since the uh, space station was uh, launched in 2000. And um, so, I, I don't know, maybe Liz or, or Katie, you guys know how many hatches there are, but there must have been about 30 of them that we were closing. It took, I don't know how long it took, but it took a long time. It was a lot of work, and then three of us got into one Soyuz spacecraft and closed the hatch. Three of us got into the other Soyuz spacecraft and closed the hatch, and then just waited um, you know, and hoped that it missed us. And I, I remember it being somewhere around 15 minutes, so we made it by about 15 minutes into the Soyuz. And um, from what I'm told, the, the piece of uh, space junk passed within 300 meters of the space station, and the relative velocity was 35 kilometers per second. So that would uh, that would have left a mark. Um, and so that was a you know, kind of a sobering uh, situation for for the uh, problem of space junk. Just circling back to a, a comment that was made about watching movies. Um, relating to like you know your own kids and everything else I just like to point out I watched uh, snakes on a plane on a plane in turbulence and I think it really added to it I think it's our, the 4D feature that we're gonna have to start going for in movie theaters is we've already got the rumble seats started but this is kind of related to a question that came up is you know would the do you think the station crew is gonna watch gravity during the rotation on station uh, okay, you you might know if they will uplink it or not. I I would definitely watch it. I would I would be eager to watch it. They can mute it. Katie, you're muted. I I don't know if they've um gotten to see it yet. I think that they wanted to, and you know, and actually, you know, this this is what people are talking about. It's a very popular movie. It's a movie made in our backyard, and. You know, and it's a chance, it's a, it's a platform for us to speak about, you know, what we really do up there, which we all think, I think everybody on this call thinks is really, really important. So I'm hoping that they do get to see it. Somebody said that they weren't going to show it to them because they, were, they, they thought the crew wouldn't want to see it. And, I mean, the crew can make their own decisions about right. that. But I wondered if there's actually a, a problem with... Um, you know, basically the director wants everyone to see this movie, or, or at least the people who screened it, in 3D. He was very insistent about that. And I wonder if, you know, he doesn't want the astronauts up on the station to, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I just know it hasn't gone up there yet. Or at least, like, not that I've heard. I have a comment to chime in uh, to follow up on what you said, Katie. I think one of the best things from my perspective perspective about this movie is that it's gotten people to talk about space flight and real spacecraft, the International Space Station. I run into people all the time who aren't even quite aware, maybe they've heard of the space station, but um, certainly don't know how large it is or what it looks like or how many people are there um, or what we're doing there. So I think that this movie showed people, people that I know, like friends from college that never really thought much about space, but when they saw how beautiful our planet looks, um, I, you know, they went and saw a popular movie. Maybe they would never go see an IMAX movie specifically about space, but this got them uh, to see what space looks like and what the Earth looks like and what some real spacecraft looks like. And, and so that's, that's great. I'm, I'm happy that this film has been so popular and it's, I think it's interesting. making people talk. To pick apart, you know, it's interesting to think about what's real and, and what's not. But something I'd be interested in what folks have to say is that I, I had heard that, you know, we, we all think about Apollo 13 and go, well, that was a pretty cool space movie, at least I thought so. And that there was a lot of inaccuracies in that movie. 
I mean, in something like Armageddon, we know that you know this is a little more science fiction, right? I but love Armageddon. That we think that really are you know real space movies. I mean, I'm hearing that they're not so accurate either, and so the fact that you know there's some inaccuracies. I mean, it's really um, I don't know. It's 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 not about how accurate it is. I guess the baseball is the most accurate of all of them. Then that's my favorite. Right. At the time Apollo 13 came out, one of the critics um, uh, said that. He could not find the film believable at all because there's no way in that the crew would ever make it back alive. <laughs> sort of like that. Um, the uh, at the time that the uh, that Apollo 13 came out, there was a series of books that were popular called the Nitpickers Guide to Star Wars or Star Trek um, that sort of picked apart each of the movies on what was real and what was not. And uh, we worked with. I was at the National Space Society at the time, and we worked with. Um, that publisher to put together the nitpickers guide to Apollo 13 and it really was a nitpickers guide because unless you knew your space history you wouldn't have ever known that something was wrong but um, what was interesting was that a lot of the critics for example criticized the scene where Marilyn Lovell uh, lost her wedding ring the morning of the launch uh, down down the drain and they said that was totally unbelievable but it actually did happen um, so again small details uh, where life is more believable than, or less believable than, than fiction. Maybe we can go down the line of uh, what movies everyone's favorite space movie is, or fiction that uh, really inspired them, or still inspires them. I guess we'll start. Well, I love, I really like this one. <laughs> I love, love Gravity. <laughs> A lot, and uh, you know, Apollo 13 happened right before my uh, first launch, and my mom depended on me to know whether she should go to the theater and see a movie or stay home and wait for the video for VHS. Right, so this was a while ago, and I saw Apollo 13. It made me want to go home and study. I mean, it just it really it was inspirational in that way. <laughs> and well, study emergency procedures or study. <laughs> well, just, you know, it's more like, you know, hey, this stuff, you know, this stuff can really happen. You better make sure you know what you're supposed to know. And I, it was inspirational in that way, but I did tell my mom that it was, you know, kind of a so-so movie and she should wait till it showed up in the, you know, in the video kiosk because she didn't need to see it before I flew. Uh, I said it earlier, I've always been a, a fan of Star Wars, kind of the, uh, the look of it and... Uh, the different creatures, different different characters you might meet out there. So I'm a Star Wars fan. I gotta say, Space Camp. Um, it was not the most realistic picture in the world, but it did set me on my track to my current career. Um, I went to see the film, somewhat kicking and screaming against my father, who I'd rather because I wanted to see Karate Kid, but um, but seeing that film as a kid changed what uh, the direction that I would take actually going to, to the real space camp and then really uh, delving into the space field. So I would say Apollo 13, I've, I've seen it more than once. Uh, so I, I, I would also agree with Katie that um, Gravity is in the same category. I thought it was from, from a, I, I liked both movies for the same reason, imagery that they, they showed and um, how realistic everything looked, and um, I, I think Apollo 13 probably portrayed astronauts a little bit more realistic, although there was a lot of license there, too, but, um, you know, you can't beat gravity, I think, for the for capturing what the planet looks like in space, uh, especially on the spacewalk, I think, um, you know, I've never seen anything that even came close, so I thought, um, so if I have to, I, I, I'm not going to pick one, I'll, 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 I'll say two, both of them. <laughs> So I'll be the weirdo and say that uh, books actually set me on my path to, to loving space exploration, and I, I really got a passion from reading about the exploration component of it. Uh, so that's what uh, started me off. But then I would watch Star Trek, and I would see these people out there having problems and solving them, and there was technology all around them, but it was still a people problem. Uh, in 2001, it's a people problem. It's still personalities. It's still people doing these things, and so that's what... Uh, eventually I realized space is just a place. It's an amazing place. It gives you a totally new view. And it's a place that people go. And so I, I love the, the, 
that Gravity is a people movie. There's a lot of technology in it, and it's a really great movie to watch, visually stunning. And it's about characters. It's about people that are out there and how they manage to be in that place. Uh, even Spaceballs. Spaceballs is so much fun, and it's all in space, and there's craziness. But it's about people being there and how they interact with that environment. And it just changes the way that uh, that you interact with things and people around you. But it's still people up there, and I think that's that's fun to to take people and stick them in the weirdest place you can, which is in a tin can in space. Uh, so if you can do that, that that's you've got me. It's interesting that's a people movie, and there's really only one person. I mean, maybe one and a half people in the movie because George <laughs> Clooney is not only in there for ten minutes. I mean, really, just one person in the whole movie, right? I mean, right. Which is, and actually, when we were talking about that before about all the press and all the um, procedures that you would have. In reality, you would want all those procedures, and the press would be looking for their downlink imagery, and you would be contacting Houston and talking to, you know, what's our procedure here, and let me get the manual there, but they lost all contact. They lost all those manuals and procedures in the shuttle when it got blasted. There was nobody else. You know, the, that's it. You've taken that all out of the narrative, and now you really just have a, okay, you've got one person who has to figure it out in the midst of this immensity of crazy... That's a that's a cool movie. Well, and when it comes down to people figuring it out, I mean, I really love what you said, Tim, because I think that's true. It, I mean, it's a very human drama, happens to take place in space, in in a in a wild place that's very dear to all of us. But it's about people. I'll mention that uh, there is a there is a call out or a shout out to Apollo 13 in Gravity, in that um, the voice of Mission Control. At the start of the film, before they lose contact, is Ed Harris, who uh, played Gene Krantz in Apollo 13. Um, and there's also a companion film to Gravity, which hasn't been widely seen yet. Uh, Jonas Quarren, the uh, son of uh, the director and also co-writer of Gravity, uh, filmed a short um, that it, at one point in the film, Sandra Bullock's character, Ryan Stone, is talking to the ground. Uh, or she's picked up a radio uh, communication with the ground um, uh, that sounds like a, a, a man with his with his baby and and with um, a dog. And Jonas has told the story from the perspective of those of the man on the ground um, in a film that comes out. Uh, uh, it's going to come out on the DVD for Gravity um, and the perspective of connecting to space. Uh, what we think by watching Gravity, the storyline of that guy is, and what Ryan's character summarizes, is not the full story of what's going on um, in terms of what she hears. That's really cool. Maybe we can get them to do like a world premiere online, um, kind of like First Orbit was on Yuri's Night. That'd be very cool. You know, the first moment, I don't know if you know, you guys, uh, Paolo, actually, Paolo and I did the film uh, Film the orbits for that. Yeah, that was um, really fantastic. How you guys were working to retrace Yuri Gagarin's orbit, what his perspective would have been over the ground, and uh, maybe you can t talk a little bit about uh, the challenges of filming from space uh, a movie of reenacting sp uh, space mission. Well, somebody was bringing this up the other day, so they're not just totally my original thoughts, but. It's interesting when you see pictures taken, uh, Don Pettit, in fact, we had this discussion, um, you see pictures taken from space. When we're in the cupola and we look at the Earth, the Earth is kind of up for us. And so if we take these pictures, like you showed your Yuri's Night picture with, a, with I mean, with Yuri in the window with the Earth uh, up on the top there. And in some ways, I think to people here on the ground, it's not quite as palatable as something where you see the Earth you know, down, you see the Earth on the bottom, and then you think of a spacecraft as going around that Earth. And so what we, you know, what we sort of accept as the norm and what looks pleasing to us, you know, isn't going to be the same as what we can do up in space. And so should we take photographs in space that please people on Earth, or should we, you know, like when, whenever you look and you see, like you turned Ron's and my picture upside down, we're almost unrecognizable. And in fact, if you show a crew picture, and you, the person who's on the bottom, who's upside down, will be almost unrecognizable, and you almost won't know that they're there. And so it has to do with the way we see things. And we had a little bit of that kind of translating to do back and forth with the folks that were directing First Orbit. So like even, even that picture of the Yuri's button, um, that 
normally when I would take those pictures, like Katie was saying, we would actually turn the camera upside down to give you the, the perspective that you would normally have up if you were on an airplane. Um, but on that particular picture, I, I purposely didn't do that because I wanted it to look a little wacky um, because I wanted to, to show the, the kind of um, uniqueness of the environment because it was your, you know, Yuri's night. But, but that's a really good point. And it's actually, um, you know, you would think when you see most of the pictures that, you know, it, in order to get those pictures that we took a, took a picture the normal way, our feet would be out of the space station. So we actually just have to take pictures with the camera upside down relative to, to us. And ironically about that movie, um, my husband, I, I couldn't go to a thing called EG, the Entertainment Gathering, kind of the intersection of TED and entertainment. And so my husband was at that and I actually joined them by uh, just by phone for a little while. And at that gathering, my husband met a guy who's a composer in England and it turns out to be the guy that wrote the music for First Orbit. So they sent me music while I was up there, and it turned out to be some of the music for First Orbit. It's a small world. Some, sometimes it is a very small world. That's what I was just thinking. <laughs> There's only six billion of us, and we all live on one planet, so it makes sense that we would meet each other. <laughs> so we're approaching our first orbit now, and... Um, I think this would probably be a good time to get some kind of closing thoughts um, or to throw in one last thought or two that you might have regarding the movie and space flight and, of course, you know, inspiring everyone else to pursue their dreams and to go after helping the overall mission of survivability of life and all those fantastic things in science. Um, so I will just kind of go across the board again one last time. Uh, Katie, if you want to lead us off. Well, you know, I, I think I, I gave lots of thoughts about the movie already, and I'd like to just close by saying to me it's really been special tonight to spend an hour and a half with with you guys. And, with, and, and you know, I, I can't see the people that are all watching and, and listening, but it's pretty special to have taken an hour and a half out to spend time with people who all have a passion for space. And, you know, sometimes that's a little bit of a lonely passion. And that's what's you know very cool about this movie to me is that we get to share some of the special things that Ron and I saw up there in space. But you know it's a special business, and everybody on this panel is part of it, and you know folks that are listening as well. And it's important, so I'm I'm happy to be here. And from my perspective, I'll I'll throw in. A, uh, a shout for all of the women scientists and young girls who, interest, who are interested in being scientists. Uh, Katie and myself, we're, we love science, we love engineering, we have awesome, fun careers. And, and don't ever let anybody, any, anybody tell you you can't do something. Um, just like Ryan Stone, you don't give up. You, uh, Maybe find another way around, or you look for another hatch. For me, um, the uh, this has been a lot of fun tonight. Um, I love sharing space with people. Um, I, if I could, I, I can't see how many people are are, are watching us right now, but I, I'd love to gift gifted every one of them with the astronaut handle or a piece of the tethered space satellite. Um, I I think there's a a common um, in enthusiasm amongst everyone for being able to vicariously live through the adventures of um, well some of our panel members tonight but also of uh, of being able to imagine the day that we'll all be able to go up there and experience what it's like gravity gives that opportunity for a large audience to, to come just a little bit closer to space and um, and projects like gravity have done wonders for if not inspiring, which I hope it does, but um, but for making people wonder and talk about uh, what it's like to to um, go into the final frontier. Yeah, I'll I'll just uh, say thanks. Thanks for for ha having me on the on the panel. It's, it's been a lot of fun, and you've heard uh, references to not, you know not our 90 minute panel here, and that's that's one trip around the Earth uh, on the space station. And I, I'll just echo the, the words that Robert said in that. Um, you know, I thought gravity was was a, a, a wonderful way to share the experience of, of, of being in space, and 
just one more tool that we have to, to share that experience. And what I experienced while I was on the space station was, you know, the proliferation of, of social media and how we could bring people along on a mission with us and have two-way dialogues. And what I really got out of that experience was no matter where the people were on the planet, um, they had that same feeling of awe and that same feeling of wonder of, of what we're doing. And these are, these are, in some cases, people that were in countries that I wouldn't normally have the, the opportunity to, to, um, to uh, share that experience with. And, and you know, I, I also want to say that, that you know, we've been talking about going into space, but, but you know, I think everybody realizes that we're already in space. We're already riding through the universe together. We're all, uh, and there's no passengers, you know, we're all, we're all crewmates. And, if I could just share one quick story about coming back to Earth, is um, when it was time to come home, my, my crewmates and I got into to our Soyuz, we undocked, we took a couple laps around the planet, we um, flew across the south tip of South America and did a fishtail basically to point our engines backwards. I remember seeing a, a crescent moon go by the window as that happened. We fired our engines, we, we, we had this wild ride through the, through the atmosphere, um, the, the chutes opened, we slammed in the ground, bounced and rolled over. And I was uh, basically on the bottom of this thing, and looking out my window, I distinctly remember seeing a, a rock, a few blades of grass, and a flower. And, and I remember thinking to myself, I'm home. And I was really, really happy to be home. And what was interesting about that is that I was in Kazakhstan. And so from, for, in that moment, home went from being Houston, Texas, to, to Earth. And I think that was really something that was moving. And it's, you know, when I see things, you know, Things like gravity and, and other ways to, to kind of capture that 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 reality that we all really are riding through the universe together on Spaceship Earth. I, I think that the better off we're all going to be, the more we see those type of things. So, I, like I said, like we've all said, you know, the movie was spectacular in that regards, and uh, to say bravo. So I'll again take a slightly different tact. Uh, when I saw the movie for the first time this week. Uh, I was coming out of the theater, and I saw it in IMAX 3D, and it was gorgeous. I strongly suggest you go and see it in, in as large of a screen and as clear of 3D as you can get it. Somebody in the audience said, well, I guess kids that are thinking about being astronauts will have to think twice now, uh, you know, because of the, the scenarios that were presented. And I got a little mad. But then I realized that kids are still dreaming about being astronauts, and kids are still excited about going to space. And here's another angle that they might not have thought about yet. You know, like they're going to come up with solutions for all these problems. Think of the kids that are going to watch this movie and figure out how to deal with orbital debris in a way that none of us could come up with. Like that's brilliant. We just gave them the opportunity to solve the crisis of their lifetime and simultaneously expose them to an orbital perspective that they might not have ever gotten before. Yeah, it's a disaster flick a little bit. And you, you know, you have all those pieces to it, but it's fantastic that, that they get that. Um, and to hear that it's such a real experience for, for people who've actually been in space uh, and, and that it accurately portrays that in a way that, that you guys feel good about. I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, as a father of two daughters, I, I didn't even notice that it was a female main character. It just didn't dawn on me that there would be any reason for it not to be a woman as the main character in this movie. Uh, and she did a fantastic job. She was a parent. She was a mother. Uh, and I, I couldn't be happier with the way that uh, she portrayed being an astronaut and being a person that's out in space. So I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, thank you so much for letting me be on the panel. Uh, I haven't been to space. I don't get to work with you guys very often. Um, but I'm really excited every time I get to take somebody up and give them a taste of weightless, a taste of what it might be like to go into space. And I look forward to the day when, when we are all up in space and we can get back on the panel and talk about it again, uh, all of us having the overview effect and having that uh, broader view of space. And so um, for as much as I can, I love taking people up and giving them that little teeny taste and watching their perspective shift because I know that happened with me. Uh, and I have a, a much profounder appreciation for how hard it is to do everything that you guys do up in space. It is not easy to move around and do things in microgravity. So um, kudos to those of you that do it and all of the training that you put in to get there. Some people uh, even play the flute the while they're in space. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I just compose... I was graceful up there. I'm not that graceful down here. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I think um, kind of the last kind of thought I'd like to leave is that 
for me, movies and the arts are really important. Have been really important for uh, for me growing up, and I'd like to thank my parents for being a big influence of that. And they saw the movie before I did, and my dad, as soon as he saw, it, he's like, "I've got an article to send you. I've got an article to send you." I'm like. I don't want to see it. I gotta wait until I, you know, I watch the movie before I read anything about this. I don't want any spoilers, and I'm excited that um, something came out that made me get people together to go, hey, let's go watch the space movie, and uh, we did it during World Space Week as part of that celebration. And I think it really added to it that you know, there not only is there an interest there, but it's a it's a complete kind of social um, corner that everyone can kind of group on and uh, just the fact that it brought people together and the fact that we were all excited, all the people on this panel and the people who are watching, to, to keep hearing more and more about it obviously shows how powerful it is. And so I hope that we're going to continue to see lots of cool space movies um, that you know push our imagination, get us to think about, is that possible? Um, you know, what can, what can I learn from this? Oh, maybe, you know, I have got an idea that came from watching this that inspired me to go on to create great things in uh, science, engineering, uh, math, uh, you know, all the STEM fields that we like to call STEAM at Erie's Night to add arts in there with the A. Um, and of course, there's many other fields that aren't represented by STEAM. And so the kind of all-encompassing, everyone can enjoy the movie aspect of it, I think is really important. So um, I don't really have much more to say except for to thank Rick Hanton, who's been running our our Google Hangout. Um, he's our director, uh, sorry, our media chair, um, and he's been doing a fantastic job. And Cassia, his fiance, has been helping him out behind the scenes today, which is great. And Jeffrey Ellis, who's been uh, sending me messages and updates and questions and trying to help me organize some of the behind the scenes stuff here as well. And that's a big thank you to the rest of our team as well. Um, and so, what we're going to leave it up with is a short film. It's a brand new film that came out this week from a group that's doing something called A Quarter of a Million Miles. And it's a project that features music and films inspired by astronaut uh, Mike Collins. And so this next one is called Carrying the Fire, um, excuse me, the uh, next film here, I don't know if I have the right name, I think it was actually something else, but um, there, there are two films out and there's two more on the way. Um, this one should be called How Vainly Men Themselves Amaze. Um, and it's cool stuff. And so with that, I'll let everyone enjoy it and rock the planet. Take it away, Rick. Thanks, Ryan.